Welcome to Abeka's very first Teacher Talk Live. My name is Cindy Quinlan. I'm an educational consultant with Abeka. I had taught grades 7 through 12 for several years at a Christian school in Northern Virginia. I'm now here in Florida. This year I'm also able to be back in the classroom and teaching a couple of high school classes over at Pensacola Christian Academy. And Teacher Talk Live is something that we hope to bring teachers together and have an opportunity to discuss topics that are particularly relevant and particularly significant at this time. And so we hope to bring those teachers together about every six weeks this coming fall semester and do hope that you're able to join us as we let you know when those teacher talks will be hosted. Now here with me as another fellow teacher is Barbie. Hi, I'm Barbie Tupua. I have enjoyed 16 years in the elementary classroom, both at a large Christian school, Pensacola Christian Academy, as well as a few years at a small Christian school. Uh, I have to confess, Cindy, that all of my teaching experience is in upper elementary. So fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, that's my comfort zone. I love to teach those grades. Uh, but what I don't have in teaching experience in those other grade levels, I have in parent experience. Uh, my husband and I have five children. And this year we are in every department of Pensacola Christian Academy. We have a daughter that started kindergarten today, first day of kindergarten. Um, our son is in first grade. We have a daughter in fourth grade, a son in eighth grade, and a daughter in 10th grade. So all the PTMs, all the orientations, <laughs> virtual or, or not, will be there, will be there. Um, so um, I'm excited that I get to be here with you and to talk to um, you teachers and maybe make some connections that will help you. Uh, and whatever challenges teachers that you're facing this school year with your students, it's likely that we are facing it either in the classroom yes. or at home parent. too. <laughs> right, right. Um, so we are going to be doing a lot of talking here at the beginning of this teacher talk, but we don't want to be the only voices in the conversation. So would you do this as, as you're listening and watching if you have a question or a comment, uh, would you just let us know by using that chat feature? Or you could email or um, even post There's on that even, social yeah, media. Connecting on social yeah. media. Yeah, so get, get us the, that information, give it to us. Let us know what we can do to help you. And we'd like at the end of our time together to uh, sit back and look at some of your questions and see what we can do to help you with your specific problems. We'll answer if we can. And, and who knows, if, if you have a topic that we need to dig deeper into, it could become yes. the topic of the next, the next teacher talk. So. Um, Welcome. Let us know what you're thinking. As Barbie said, there's the chat feature. Even you may be able to speak to each other as you're watching. I think one of the greatest uh, blessings and encouragement as teachers is to talk to fellow teachers. We can cheer each other on. We can pat each other on the shoulder. We can let each others borrow our shoulders to cry on us. We need to. Um, but we do hope to hear from you. And even if you, in the days to come, in the weeks to come, you have some topic ideas, do email us, as Barbie said. Schools at Abeka.com is an easy email that you can use and just say, hey, I would like to hear more about this topic. What are other teachers doing at this point? And also connect with us on social media. I'm not as big on social media, um, but I know many of you are quite social media savvy and you'll be able to connect there. I also I also want to say, for those of you who've taken the time to join us today, we have a small treat for you. In the next 24 hours or so, you will be receiving an email from us, and in that email will be a promo code. And that promo code will be good for 25% off any digital product on abeka.com. So a lot of you will probably want to look at our digital teaching aids. And those will be some great resources for this coming year, whether you're teaching in the classroom or whether you are having to start out the year virtually with your students at a distance. So be looking for that email. In addition to that promo code, you're also going to receive a recording of this teacher talk. Some people sign up and life happens. Mm -hmm. and you weren't able to join this, but uh, we trust that you'll still be able to see it maybe in a recording. And so I know one of the things Barbie was able to do in the last couple weeks, some of you likely joined us in our virtual summer seminar that we hosted just at the beginning of August. And Barbie, you went through a lot of questions that yeah. people were sending in. Yes, I got to see questions from several different separate Q&A mm -hmm. sessions, and there were a lot of questions that were common among all of those age groups. Um, so things that people are concerned about, wondering about, and how to approach. And uh, I, think we've, I think we're going to tackle some of those. So we wanted to address some of those, realizing that this has come from some of you maybe directly, 
but from others, teachers just like you. And one of the first ones is just there is a lot of anxiety, hesitation, maybe all the way to fear about what will it be like when students come back to the classroom or even just when students start the year. How much remediation will be needed? How much review will be needed? So we're going to talk about some general guidelines or tips or suggestions we would give as well as then maybe as you're working with your class some individual students will need some one-on-one -on -one help and we'll discuss some topics about that. But the first thing I want to say is don't invite trouble potentially there may not be as much remediation involved as you think there might be. Many, many Christian schools were able to transition very well from the classroom to ministering to their students from a distance. And because of that, the students were still able to learn. A lot of what we see in the news about concerns where there were so many non-Christian schools, there were many public school systems, not all, but many, even those from where I used to teach in Nor Northern Virginia, that they pretty much did not teach. Mm -hmm. Starting from March, that was it. If anything, the kids got worksheets, but nobody was checking in on them. So if the anxiety that you feel is maybe more from hearing everyone else's anxiety, stop to think about what your school did and how much your school likely was still able to help those children. Children. So there may not be as much remediation as you might think. But I think secondly is if you're teaching with the Abeka curriculum, that built-in spiral review is always beneficial, but it will especially come into key this year. Because if you're afraid that your students missed out on something, if you're able to follow that curriculum, you're going to hit it again. They will not never get the opportunity to learn it. So those are just some things right off the bat that as you may be feeling some anxiety, think of where is this anxiety coming from? Is it just maybe inviting worry? Or it could be that you do have some logistics in front of you and you know help is going to come. And so sure. we've got some ideas for there. Right. And as you, I mean, the students have been out of the classroom for months now, longer than normal. And so as you're at beginning this new school year and you're training your habits and your procedures um, with your students and your routines and your expectations, that always takes time at the beginning of a school year. And this year it might take a little bit longer uh, just because of the length of time that students have been without that kind of routine. So right off the bat, as you are preparing your students and training them in your classroom, uh, I think it's huge to, to set up the student's understanding of your expectations of their attentiveness. Because all of the review that you can do in all of the world won't <laughs> help if they're not paying attention. So really establish that at attentiveness habit right off the bat. Real, just In elementary, you just can lavishly praise them for paying attention. Uh, and just in random ways, you can be uh, teaching penmanship or something and saying something along the lines of, okay, now as you're writing this letter, make sure that you class stand and just wait to see who's going to be listening and thinking and who will pop up and just gush about how they are, um, not only are they quiet in your classroom and their eyes are on you, but they were listening and thinking with their brain about what the teacher was saying. Uh, and th that will go a long way in these early days um, to set yourself up for success with that review and the other the other things that you can do to help your students. Um, so definitely think about doing something along those lines. And that doesn't hurt in the high school classroom either. You won't <laughs> lavish the praise. You were listening. Um, but really, you, you want a strong level of engagement no matter what. But it may be in those first couple of days, especially, you might ask even more questions than you typically would. You may have them standing at one point here or there, but you may have them standing a minimum of three to four times. Stand as you answer this question. Just to bring in that movement, just like you said, get them focused, get them realizing. My goal here is not just to be looking at the teacher, but to be listening and thinking about what the teacher says. So if we've taken heart that it's not as bad as we fear it might be. And if we set up some good procedures and some good routines with our students at the beginning of the year, then we can get down to the business mm -hmm. of teaching. And um, we might still need to make some adjustments here as we are kind of, we've got a, a bit of a, uh, what would we say, a, a steeper curve? incline? Uh, Potentially, uh, <laughs> yeah. Neither one of us are the upper math teachers. So we're saying, what does that look like? But, but that curve, you know, sometimes there may be a gentler curve. Maybe there's a steeper curve this year. So we need to think about how we can approach our, our curve curriculum, our materials, our assignments in ways that are beneficial to the students where they are. 
we don't want to lower our expectations. We're not trying to dumb anything down, but we, we need to kind of maybe help them along a little bit more. And there are things that you can do to adjust your assignments, to adjust your um, approach to some things that um, that could help. I was thinking about what if I was teaching second grade, second grade phonics and language, and my students are having, right here at the beginning of the year, are having a, a hard time with some of those special sounds that they're learning. I, I just randomly today opened up to lesson 10 in second grade. Um, so pretty close to the beginning of the year. And if I found that my students were struggling with this, but I, what, what am I going to do? How can, I, I've got this worksheet and we finish it, we still don't get it, now what? Well, you, I, I, the, again, I just did this so randomly. I looked at curriculum and thought, what book, what reading book are the students in um, at Lesson 10? And it's this book, Fun with Friends. And so I opened up to some pages that are part of Lesson 10, same, so same day in reading class. And don't you know, there are, one, two, there are four special sounds on this phonics worksheet. I found three of the four here on this reading page that we're going to look at on the same day. So I, I bet the curriculum is made to overlap it self like that and that's a wonderful thing but you can use things like your other subjects to help support a weaker area if, if you needed to um, so that's one thing that you could do if you were in you know in second grade um, I was thinking about fourth grade as well this is a, a new book this yes. year and there's a section in this book it's kind of like a supplementary exercise section um, it's a very flexible section it's called take five in each each lesson that has a take five section, it's just five little sentences or five things to do. Um, so they're fairly short. They're always review. So if you, uh, this I just opened up here to the first page of them, starts on lesson six. If you're on lesson six, this is something that the students should be ready for. So you can use these, you can use these in a variety of ways, these little activities, but they would be great um, additions okay. to your course of your lesson um, for, you know, just something further review or yep. further reinforcement. If you say, oh, this is something we're struggling in, where can I go to find more help with that? Look at your take five in fourth grade. It's going to help you. And so it, again, going back to the curriculum, not only has that spiral review writ in, but there is also a lot of these extras that you can bring in. And so the planning and preparation, once you determine where your students might need a little bit more time, you likely have the resources to help them at your fingertips. And so it doesn't have to feel yes. as if you have to go reinvent the wheel. And again, even in the upper grades, sometimes in a, a separate supplementary workbook, but we have supplementary exercises. And the main area for remediation are the skill subjects. Right, right. So the phonics, the language, mm -hmm. the arithmetic, the math and the upper math. And so we have grammar supplementary exercises. We have those arithmetic, those math and seventh and eighth supplementary exercises that if it's just, I need a couple more problems to reinforce this with my students, you have those resources there. But I think even just the normal built in already established review is something that you can take advantage of. Um, I know in fourth and six, you've taught both language arts as well as the arithmetic, yes. but every day, there is a review section. And often when talking with teachers, that's the first thing to go. And we want to say, no, 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 that's the first thing to leave. <laughs> a review is the great equalizer among students. We have students of very many uh, skills. Some of your students honestly could learn without a teacher, but the majority of your students need a teacher. They need that review. And so that's where you're coming in and you're helping those struggling students Keep that review. If you see in your curriculum that it says to review this section, review that. Mm -hmm. And I know we were talking about review earlier. Sometimes we want to spend most of the class on review. So there's that balance that yes. needs to come. Yes, yeah, it, it can be. Uh, I, I used to get carried away with review. And in history and science, especially if the curriculum, you know, I'd, I would see review previous lesson. But I would think I need to review the entire chapter, no matter how far we've gotten into the chapter. And I could use up a lot of my class mm -hmm. time on review. In history and science, I would say your students, even with even with things falling off last last year, they're going to recover in history and science more easily than they will in the skill subjects. So that's really that's why we're focusing on those subjects um, today. And sometimes you do need to add in a little bit extra review. And so instead of that eight to 10 minutes of review in arithmetic, you might want it to be 12 or 15 minutes, but you have to find a place for that time to come yes. from. You can't just say, oh, we're not going to the restroom today, kids. <laughs> Get out your math book. No, it doesn't we work. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
<laughs> we can't do that. So I, I've thought of some things that, that we could do. Uh, again, this doesn't take much. I probably thought this through in about three minutes. It doesn't take a lot of planning ahead, mm -hmm. just a little. Um, I opened up to Lesson 11 here in the fifth grade arithmetic book, and there are 30 problems on this worksheet. And if I were trying to cut back on the class work time to um, give me more review time with my students, I, I sometimes, like you say, mm -hmm. review seems to be the first thing to go. I might be tempted to say, okay, we'll get the front page done. And when that's done, we will put it aside. But I would, I would suggest a different strategy. If I were to take of these six division problems in section one, if we did three, that's adequate practice. The next two sections each have three problems. If we did two of the three in each of those, story problems are so important, but if I took up one of the two, and just keep in my mind that if I have an extra minute at the end of my class, it's the Go story back. problem I'm coming back to. Uh, review section here now, the first section there has eight problems. If I cover four of those eight, and then one of the two averaging problems, and then three or four of the division problems that are part of review, I can cut this 30 problem worksheet down to 17. And that's a third, almost, a, mm -hmm. almost half of my worksheet that I'm still covering every concept, but I've bought myself some valuable minutes that I can put back into that class review or to focus on that particular area that this group of students seems to be struggling with. Um, so there, there are surely things that you can do that don't that you don't have to sacrifice the quality of your overall lesson in order to hit that one area that needs a little bit more attention. So if you have to adapt that review, do it with balance. You can add a few minutes to it. You can wisely choose where you can then take those few minutes from, but we don't need to make everything a review and not teach the students. Because right. again, that, that spiral review is going to kick in. So these are some general guidelines that apply to the whole class. Just as you come in the first couple days, some of you have likely already started school. I, I started school, Barbie's kids have started school this week, and I was chuckling. I said, okay, teacher talk live. How <laughs> live will some of these teachers be? End of the day, How live will end I of the week, be? Right? <laughs> <laughs> we may be sitting here breathing, but live maybe uh, a little bit iffy um, but you're you've already seen then you know where your students may need that and maybe some of you have realized hey there wasn't as much remediation as I needed but even during a normal year we will have students often mm -hmm. specific individuals that need help some a lot more than others so again there are things that we can do then with specific students to help them one is just utilize the study halls the study time in, in elementary upper mm -hmm. elementary fourth fifth sixth graders often have a designated study time work time that can be a time that you work with some students um, in even 7 through 12, a lot of the students may have one study hall hour. You may say, but I'm not free to help them during study hall. But perhaps an upper classmate is. So if your school hasn't yet developed some type of program, just very casual, but where upper class students that do well, that are willing to volunteer, maybe get some sort of partial credit or extra credit, they can help a lower classman that is struggling. So you have someone helping your struggling student while you you're working with your responsibilities other, elsewhere. So think of those study hall times and how you might be able to use them. But a lot of it does become a help class, a help class either before school or a help class after school. When do you find, for elementary especially, that help classes work as far as the time? Typically, help class works very well in the morning before school starts. So from 7.30 to 7.50, that gives you 20 minutes of time and then still gives your students time to prepare for the rest of the day, you know, from 7.50 to 8 or whenever your school starts. Um, so what is that? That's, I'm thinking, like 30 minutes before the beginning of the regular school day. Many parents will, will be ready and willing to drop off their students a few minutes early uh, to help get them to a help class. So you could do two days a week for arithmetic and two days a week for language, 20 minutes each time. That's the thing equivalent of one complete language class or almost one extra arithmetic class in your week. So that, that, that matters. That's a yes. lot. Yeah. And it wouldn't have to be all on you if you're thinking, wait a minute, that's four days. The four through six teachers could say, okay, this is your week to take the language help class and this is your week to take the arithmetic. And the first through third could also help each other out. And you may have a minimal students that need it and you may do one math help class a week and one 
language arts help class a week. And 7th through 12th, it could be in the morning. Uh, sometimes we find that the, the older kids are a little more alert in the afternoon. <laughs> so those are often scheduled for 30, 45 minutes in the afternoon. They can typically afford to go a little longer and still be concentrating. But that's typically once a week. So what time would work for you? And again, divvy it up. It doesn't have to be just this person, but who could help in the math area? Who could help in the language? Now, I don't want you, though, to feel pressured though that this is an extra prep. Now I have to find something to do with those students for 20 minutes, for 30 minutes, so for 45. What have you found works well in your help classes? Well, I have taught arithmetic help class before and I've taught language help class many times and it is an extra it is an extra prep. So I'm trying to think of ways that I can maximize my preparation for school make the most of the time that I have with my students and make it truly beneficial to them. And when I taught arithmetic help class, my favorite strategy uh, that was really a time saver for me, it helped me in so many ways, was that I would take my arithmetic curriculum for the day and there's that section of oral review that is eight minutes long approximately. And I, I would have already put my charts up on the board. I've got my flashcards laid out for arithmetic class for the day. So everything's already ready. There's no extra prep. Then I can just kind of do a run through of the day's review. I trust curriculum, mm -hmm. so cur if curriculum says these things are important to review, I know my students need them. So I take those first eight minutes of help class and run through the review of the day. It helps me in, in my now preparation have, for the day. you can do it twice. Yes, yes, and uh, when we get to review an arithmetic class a as a whole class, then those students that were there for help class that tend to struggle with things, they have a little added measure of confidence. They've done this before. So um, I think that that really helped them. And then that really cut down on what I needed to do as far as prep. And then you could focus maybe on uh, a test that they've recently taken. What are some problems that right. they struggled with, their mm -hmm. homework, or again, if if you didn't get to all of the problems in a lesson, those are some extra problems that you could go to. Now, language, does it work fairly similar? You could go to the language review as well. Yes, and then one of the fa my favorite things to do at the language um, help class, I made for myself a little sentence bank where I went and got a hold of a, when I was in fourth grade, as a fourth grade teacher, I went and got a third grade language book. And I went through each of the concepts that fourth grade teaches and I pulled out the sentences from third grade. They're, they tend to be a little bit simpler and those help class students often, they need that, that simplicity. Uh, so I, and then I could even go to the book for the grade ahead. So I could go to okay. the fifth grade book and pull a little bit that could be maybe, maybe not for help class, but maybe for my regular class, something that could be an extra challenge for somebody along the way. Um, but it just, I, I I'm learning to be a writer, but I tend to make sentences too complex, and I would write something like, we want to go to the mall. And Okay, what's the verb? Well, is it want or is it like? A fourth grader isn't going to know the difference between how those words are used in a sentence. So pulling from sentences that have already been vetted, written, the, that, that was a help to me, and it saved me tons of time can go with it. And in the upper grades, I mentioned earlier the supplementary books. Those are a great resource. Again, also the textbooks that the students are using in class have been created with more than necessary exercises. So you don't often get to or need to get to all of them in a lesson. So you can go back and you can work on some of those areas with your students without having to think, I have to come up with sentences on my own, right. or I have to come up with ideas or scour the internet and, and get those. So minimal prep for you to help those students. And then I think the other big thing is you may say, well, that's all nice once you know what your students' yes. weak areas are, yes. but what if I'm meeting with my students mm -hmm. virtually and I haven't gotten the chance to know them or I'm planning that first week of school, I want to start off strong, but I won't know what to help them with. What are some suggestions of finding out for your new students coming in what they may need to work on? There are two really great sources of information about your class. One would be the previous year's teacher. Talk to that. We have to be careful there not to set up some uh, expectations that we wouldn't want to have about our students, but we can ask what did the students tend to struggle with. So last year's teacher is going to be a great resource there for concepts that were a challenge and even for what students should I keep my eyes on. Um, and then the parents. 
the, par the parents are the experts on that child. So you're the expert on your teaching field and on your content, but they're the expert on the child. So um, when you're having your orientation, whether it's virtual or in person, or when you're making those first phone calls, um, just put a little bug in their ear about, um, hey, listen, I'm, I'm thinking about starting up a help class to help out things here at the beginning of the year. Would your child be interested in that? Would they benefit from it? What subject? And, and let, really let them know that you're listening to their concerns and then act on that. And yeah, they, that can be great. And that keeps you looking professional. You're not saying, what does your child need help with? Because then all of a sudden they're thinking, well, you're the teacher, don't you know? No, you're just saying, hey, I'm... I'm ready. I'm going to be helping them. Let me hear from you. And just, I love the way that you communicate that. So when you get the recording, you can go back to this minute, <laughs> note where it is. And just a really good way of communicating that and getting the parents on board, getting them ready to help you too. And just before we switch off to hearing some of your questions, some of your statements as well, one of the questions you saw a lot as you were sorting through the summer seminar uh, Q&As was, what can I do to help or be most effective when I'm teaching my students online, when I'm teaching them from a distance. And so ever since March came, one of the things I've been doing for the last five months is, is reading and going to different blogs or going to different teacher resources and kind of beginning to hear and see what are people doing and saying this is a best practice, this is a best practice. So I've written down some things that I have seen as best practices that may give you kind of an idea of where to start. First of all, and I think this one is a little bit obvious, is, <laughs> is be warm, be cheerful. You want to get across to them and right now you have a, a little screen in between you two. So the warmth of your voice is more important than ever, that sincere smile. But I think it also helps to be very clear, and often that clarity can be written, even with the younger children that you may be teaching, of, okay, what are the items needed for this lesson? You might say you need your phonics book, you need a pencil, an eraser, and a piece of paper. And have that listed. And if you're working with them live, you may say, now I'm going to wait 30 seconds, 45 seconds while you go grab that. Or if you're doing a recorded session, you could say, pause the video, come back and start it once you have those items. So be specific with the items that are needed, even have it physically listed. Do the same thing too, though, with your expectations. You were talking about expectations mm -hmm. at the beginning mm -hmm. of the year with focusing, attentiveness. What do you expect your students? It could be everybody is on mute when they first come on until called on. It could be if you have a question, type it in the chat box or email me. It could be something like, when I ask you a question, type out your answer, but don't hit send. I really like that one because that means everybody has to think mm -hmm. on their own. They can't look at someone else's answer. Mm -hmm. And then when the teacher says go, all the students <laughs> hit go. And you can even say, now go back and find a classmate who has a similar answer to you or who you think added something to your answer. So those are some expectations that you can clarify with them. I think on the older student level, if you train them in this the first couple of sessions, then you don't need to hit it every time. You just remind them. But on the lower level, it might not hurt every time, just to be clear with those students. Encourage students to respond with nonverbal cues. Have a thumbs up, a thumbs down. And when I heard that, that made me think of getting different colored paper and having them show a green card or red card or a yellow card and that would represent something because that gets them physically interacting. You can see their faces. They realize my teacher sees me. She's she's needing to see what I am doing. You can use that in a lot of ways to that colorful paper. You could use it in a asking, you know, true false questions for yes. review. Green is for true, red is for false. Show me your answer. You could use it as just a quick touch. Uh, you've taught a concept and uh, you want to know who's getting it and who's not. If you say, this makes sense to me, show me green. This doesn't make a bit of sense to me, show me red. And then, then you know maybe who to go back to one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, with a little bit of tutoring. Or you can tell from if you see a sea of red on your screen, then it's time to back it back <laughs> up a little bit. We're going to focus on this at this time. So just a lot of ideas, and it helps them know, okay, I'm participating with my class. If you have a PowerPoint or some type of thing that you're showing on the screen most of the time, okay, and just take that away and go back to that face to face where you're at least looking at their faces and they're looking at yours and then even you may be doing live classes but that doesn't mean you have to be working with them the whole time same way that a teacher in the classroom would 
teach mm -hmm. for a few minutes, give them time to work independently, and then come back to them. You can say, all right, after 10 or 15 minutes, now work on this, make it specific, make it clear, we'll come back at 125, I will be here to ask any questions. And they're most likely going to be more conscientious about their work, knowing that their teacher is there. And then at 125, you come back. Now, all of these tips have been specifically for those teaching. A lot of teachers have been able to take advantage, like many of your children's teachers mm -hmm. did this past year, with Abeka's Pro Teach videos. And the benefit of those videos was not that, woohoo, less work. Oh, no. <laughs> um, those teachers were still working more. But what they were able to focus on was reaching the students was communicating with them, was helping students that were struggling, was communicating with the parents. The level of communication parents had to do or teachers had to do last year was just incredible. Mm -hmm. So when they didn't have to worry about every day having a lesson or recording a lesson, they could focus on meeting their students' emotional needs as well as mental and letting them know that they were there. So Pro Teach videos are a great option and those are just the Abeka videos. They've been taped in, in K4 all the way through 12th grade classrooms and the students are getting that same quality content. But some of you may be doing some of your own videos, and so those were some good resources. Before we transfer over to our Q&A, I see some of you have already written down some things. Let me just remind you that if you think of some good ideas for good topics, don't only put them here in the chat function, but also email them to us at schoolsatabeca.com and then connect on social media posts. And don't forget that email that you will be receiving in the next 24 hours that will have a special promo code for you to use. Look for a digital item on abeka.com. Any digital item, you will have 24 25% off on that digital item for that one-time purchase. And that's a, just a special thank you. It's a special treat. Teachers love treats. <laughs> I know I'm an older, older kid. Uh, teacher, but I still love treats with, with the rest of them. Um, so be looking for those things. And now let's transfer to that Q&A. Here is from Miss Glenna. She says, good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon. <laughs> is it a must to complete both pages in each arithmetic book for the lesson of the day? And I think you had said it's good to make sure you cover every section. Right. You want to cover all the topics, all the concepts. But I, I, I would say that we're, we're, we're needing to make adjustments, right? So, Glenna, I think you would be fine to be specific about what you want your students to do and put it on the, write it on the board, section numbers and letter numbers or whatever it is that you need to do so they know what your expectations are. But definitely easing back a little bit on there, it, it, that's an easy way to make sure that their quality of education is still what it should be but frees you up with some flexibility for other things. And some of those other things could be not that they're doing less work, but they're just doing different work. Right, right, right. So if you know they need to focus on certain problems that aren't being reviewed in that lesson, you can bring in some of those extra problems while being flexible. Right. And I know some people are, are cynical. I tend to be a cynical person myself. And if we keep saying, well, the curriculum says it, the curriculum says it, the curriculum is just papers. But mm -hmm. it's been papers written by people like Barbie Tabua. <laughs> and I love hearing her talk. I was able to, to watch her a couple years in, in the, ago in, in the class classroom as I was learning more about the elementary. She's a phenomenal teacher. So it's the curriculum is a little bit like having teachers like Barbie in the classroom with you, just giving you suggestions that they have seen work time and time again. And that's why we encourage you to at least consider it and, and look at it well, be flexible, but realize that a lot of this has been tried and true in many mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. COVID may be the first time we've had COVID, but it's not the first time schools have experienced differences right. in the year. So that's why we encourage you to be following that curriculum. From a, if I mispronounce this, I apologize. I'm going to go with the last name from Ms. Jackson. How are you able to do evaluations virtually? I understand the concept of teaching virtually, but how do you evaluate each child? Let's say this was first, second grade. You, you had a son in K-5 too. Mm -hmm. um, I know the evaluations even in K-5 are different than first grade. What are some ways of a phonics teacher or a reading teacher needing to evaluate virtually? Um, because reading grades come so much from oral reading, you uh, have your student pull out the book that you want them to read from. And we like to grade them on a cold reading, so yes. something that they've not read over and over and over again. And so you pick a page, and you, you might plan it in advance. 
you might not need to. You just open a page to something that you um, that is appropriate for them and have them read to you right from that. And you're following along in your teacher edition while they're reading from their student edition. And then I would encourage you not only to, to check then their oral reading in that way, um, but you, you could do special mm -hmm. sounds the same way or you know phonics things, um, but you could also check their reading comprehension. Get in at, when they're done with their little section of reading, ask them a question from what they've read and see if they can answer that question. Comprehension is a very important part of reading, so uh, hit that as well. And so often that involves some of that one-on-one -on -one interaction, yes. so you would need to yeah. do that yeah. separately from mm -hmm. your classmates. One mother shared with me, um, her son was in first grade at the time, so she shared with me a clip of how that first grade teacher would evaluate the student. Uh, would call each student about once or twice each week and had a variety of arithmetic, phonics, and just smoothly talked with the child, encouraged, laughed with the child, but at the same time mm -hmm. was asking the child questions. And that gave her kind of a basis of where is this child. And some of it she took as a grade. Some of it was just the teacher feedback. I think for often paper type tests, parents became the proctors yes. and parents would mm -hmm. often pick up packets. And if you think of, well, I'm not sure how the parents would be with, with the just keeping the test, make it a formal initiation of they are a proctor. So I've proctored for friends, for colleagues before. I have to sign a document saying what I will do and what I won't do. And you can encourage the parents in that way of letting them know, hey, when you have these tests, this is how you give it, this is how you don't. And that'll mm -hmm. just let them know. And I think the big thing is just communicating. Tests aren't about a grade. It's not about that if the student gets a good grade, he will do better in life. It's if the student gets an accurate grade, he will do better. So encourage parents about why letting the students take the test on their own is important. That is what will help the student in the long run, not getting good grades. Last year, parents became proctors they didn't ask for that. Yeah. It just fell on their laps. Yes. But this year, we can go into it with a little bit more intention. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, having more of a formal uh, approach to it, I think, is a great idea. And I think just appreciating the parents. And a lot of that goes with what is the, uh, the atmosphere, so to speak, with your school, with the ministry. Mm -hmm. Are the parents on board? Are they feeling like, why am I proctoring? And thinking of how can I encourage them as principals, as teachers, have some type of parent appreciation mm -hmm. or, or do different mm -hmm. things like that of letting them feel part of the team and working with their students in that way. Uh, Ms. Sweeting asks, will a recording of today's session that will be emailed? So in the, the next 24 hours or so, you will receive an email and there will be a link to this recording. So yes, ma'am, that will be recorded. Um, can you demonstrate how you teach the preschool students while still maintaining social distance? Because sometimes they need help to train them how to hold a pencil. Now, I'm not sure. There's been a lot of hand sanitizer going on in our <laughs> classrooms, a lot of hand sanitizer, a lot of mask wearing when we're working with students one on one. So I couldn't say for sure that in those situations, the teacher is taking the student's hand. I think some of that would have to do what your county is encouraging. But if you're allowed to use hand sanitizer, take the student's hand and then use hand sanitizer again, that may be it. Do you have any suggestions if you can only just demonstrate from a distance for them? I don't know if this is something that was found in curriculum. Remember, I haven't taught yes. in the in the in preschool or lower elementary, but I remember when my children were learning things, and I remember um, I don't remember if it was my oldest or my second child talking about um, the the mom and the dad sit in the front seat of the car, and so they she pinched her pencil with them, and then the other kids sat in the back, and the way that they were holding the pencil, then the kids could wave from the back seat of the car. So it, it was something simple and kind of silly, and but it, it worked and it was easy for my, my daughter or my son to remember it. In upper elementary, we just say pinch. I kind of hold my fingers up like this, pinch and rest and draw those fingers up underneath. And so you, you, you kind of have to exaggerate mm -hmm. your motions, but if you can't get close, you can still teach that. And that especially position. that creative way will be some way that they understand. And as you were saying that, that made me remember one teacher shared, she has, uh, I think, baby socks. So she purchased baby socks, and she has the students put on a baby sock on their last three fingers. They can't move them separately then. They become one unit within that baby sock. That's so cute. And for that teacher, that works really well with her students with helping them with the pencil. All right, this is from 
Uh, Ms. Rogers, thanks so much for your time. Appreciate your joining us. They're able to begin in person. And is it copyright infraction for me to record myself teaching using the Abeka curriculum? If you don't mind emailing that question at schools at abeka.com. Again, that is schools at abeka.com. And the reason I say that is it kind of depends on, on what is showing and what is not. And we always appreciate teachers who are conscientious mm -hmm. of that. And it's not so much our copyright, it's that we try to infuse our curriculum with so many pictures, our history books with so many pictures, and the copyright that we must abide from the owners of those pictures, that often determines what mm -hmm. we're able to endorse with our books. So it's usually protecting others' copyright that we may have that. So if you don't mind going ahead and emailing that question, schools at abeka.com, maybe filling in a little bit more information, what you would be using, what you would be showing, and we can try to get back to you with that one with some more specific ones. Now, as you are thinking of, I'm about to get 25% off on any digital product that I have, some things that you may not be aware of that have come out just recently have been some of the second grade digital teaching uh, items. So we started the, a lot of the digital teaching in third grade and got so much great response from teachers that now our publishing team are working backwards and, and trying to fill in for those second and first grade teachers. So Spelling 2 teaching charts are available right now. Some of you that may be perfect, whether you're digital or in-classroom. Often our in-classroom teachers like to have the physical and the digital element. They can manipulate the digital ones. They can put little coverings on it. There's a, even a how-to video that comes with those teaching charts that'll help you do that. But think of those as you're going through. Any tips for teaching speed drills virtually for fifth grade? Now I'm thinking the first thing I think of is is just the flashcards um, going through, but I think speed drills would there be the physical There is a written, written product mm -hmm. that is called speed drills. Um, I think you you could approach them almost the same way that you would in in the classroom. Um, set a timer, whether it's something that the students can see or or not. Um, have them have their paper ready, handy, and make it make it just part of the normal normal review. We're going to do our three minute speed drill have your that when you mm -hmm. start your lesson needed. and you list what's mm -hmm. needed they get that ready so it's it's there and ready to go um, some grades and I'm not sure if fifth grade is one of them some grades have a graded speed drill once a week and so maybe that's where we need to you know just pause ourselves for a moment and say is this is this going to work can, mm -hmm. can we grade it and be fair and consistent with our with our grading and maybe it would have to be not right now. We, we're not going to be able to grade those right now. And, and that's okay. That's okay. So. They can still have the practice. They right. can still do right. it. And just to add that physical element in, say, when you're done, go ahead and stand. Mm. And they can still Great stand idea. and you can see them on Zoom and who's standing and who's not standing. So you can still make it a lot of fun. I do, I do love the speed drill aspect. <clears throat> And just as far as the energy some of the kids have. So again, thank you for those of you who have joined us. Look for other um, communications about when our next Teacher Talk Live will be and what the topic will be. We're especially focusing on what is going on right now. So your feedback, your comments, email us some good topics you'd like to hear about at schoolsatabeca.com. And I hope that you'll be joining us, maybe some other different teachers next time, <laughs> but joining us for our next Teacher Talk. Thank you for coming.